My my first uh, meeting with Bud Helmrich was back in the early 60s, and he was always on a set of Edo floats or on a Cessna airplane. In fact, if you look at this movie we're looking at, that is a Cessna 140 uh, on 1650 floats, and then he moved up to um, a Cessna 180, and uh, he always called them the Arctic Turn. And Bud was probably the most famous Arctic bush pilot and Arctic explorer that there's ever been. He went up there in the late late 40s. In the 50s, he was pretty much established up there. And his main living at the in the beginning was a was a guard a guide for polar bear hunting. And he had these stories, the most unbelievable stories you'd ever seen. You'd meet him someplace, Fairbanks or Barrow or someplace like that. And he would fly you out over the um, Arctic ice, or the Arctic, Arctic Ocean. And most of the time, they'd be hunting in Alaska. Excuse me, they'd be hunting in Russia. And they would camp out there on the ice. And, you know, in those days, you weren't supposed to be able to shoot a polar bear the same day you saw it. And they claimed they all abide by the law, but I'll leave that judgment up to you. And they would spot a polar bear, camp for the night. And the next morning, uh, bring it out and hunt it, uh, hunt it and bring it home. And those trips in those days were still expensive. They were twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars, and you were allowed to hunt polar bear. From this, he basically got into. Um, he became very famous. One of the exploits that he did, and nobody even recorded this. It's, it's written up in some of his books and stuff. In the early '60s, he left from. Uh, Colville, which is where he had his residence, we'll get in that a little later, Colville, Alaska, which is up there right on the Arctic Ocean, and he flew, he took his, took a 170, and he extra tanked it, and he flew all the way to the North Pole, circled around the North Pole, and came home. And he never really got any credit for it, because he wasn't one of these guys always tooting his horn, but it's quite something. He went to the North Pole in an airplane probably 20 years before anybody else tried it. He was a very religious man. We had, uh, I had dinner with him numerous times. Every time I go to Alaska, I try to go see him in Fairbanks or go up and see him at Walker Lake. I've been to Colville once, and he, um, I would always have a Bible out and he'd do a prayer. He established um, quite a fishing business up there where they're catching a white fish and drying it. He, um, from all his exploits up there and being out on the ice and everything else, he probably became the leading expert when the oil companies decided to move into the. Uh, that area, northern Alaska, to do uh, oil exploration work, and he was hired as an expert by the oil companies on how to how to travel lakes and what you could do. And as they moved out in the Bering Sea and the Arctic Ocean stuff, he became the expert that told them whether they could drive the uh, these tremendous freight trains, you know, the tremendous weights, whether the ice was safe. And he made quite a living doing that. He was really quite a famous guy. He um, uh, he built a beautiful, beautiful. Um, Lodge on a place called Walker Lake, which is about two or three hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle, and it was just the I last time I saw him, I spent some time with him. I spent three days up there, and I remember sitting there drinking a bottle of wine on this absolutely crystal clear lake, and a, a mall airplane came in and landed in the most glassy water I've ever seen in my life, and it was a beautiful landing, a beautiful sight. So. I, I've always had very fond memories of Bud, and he was a great correspondent. He would write me monthly and quite lengthy letters and tell me about they'd raised the caribou there, and they knew that. But he also knew how to hustle things. He um, talked um, ABC's Wild World of Sports thing, and that they ought to have um, do a movie on him. And I, when Cliff Robinson was alive and we did a lot of things with him, um, Cliff said he went up there, and they went up in a DC-3, and the one thing Bud told him, he said, now bring plenty of steaks and fresh vegetables because there's no food up here, and, you know, we can't feed, can't feed you all. So he said they had, I don't know, four, five hundred or 500 or 1,000 pounds of steak and these vegetables, and the second the airplane left, landed, Bud took all this stuff and put it in his underground freezer and stuff, and for the next two weeks, all he ate was caribou and stuff that Bud had grown or, or Lincoln and stuff like that that they picked off of the ground. So he knew how to hustle, too, and make a pretty good living. I uh, had two sons. Uh, they were homeschooled until I think their junior or senior year, and then they went to Fairbanks. And one of them became a, um, um, I can't think of the name of it, the Oxford student in England. And the other one went to, a, I think, went to Harvard. And they both moved up there, and they kept the family business doing prestige work of, of oil lines and consultings and hunting and stuff like that. Now, that's kind of a quick story on Bud. And now Bud, Bud passed away about, um, about three years ago, and he died on January the 27th, 2008. 
2010. He was 92 years old. And he's probably the most famous for a book he wrote that's still around, and I've got a couple of copies. And uh, the name of the book was um, The Last of the Bush Pilots. And it's a book about the men who made the new legends of the wilderness and the travel in the Alaska. And this is really before there was any nav age. I mean, he never probably ever had a GPS. Or he maybe had some A&N beacons, but he was too far up north for that. So he, he's a guy who truly lived, worked, and flew in the Arctic with never having a major navigation aid. So he certainly knew how to read maps and stuff like that. Uh, Dave, I can keep going, or you want to make it longer or shorter? No, you can keep going if you like. Okay, uh, you know, I just have such fond memories of him because he was, you know, a guy who did an awful lot of good. He never really um, uh, tooted his whistle too much. He was a member of the Explorers Club. I remember he spoke one year, and I went into the Explorers Club and heard him speak. And uh, and um, he's really a loss. He was not a blowhard like a lot of these guys telling you all the wonderful things. And, and probably one of the finest memories I have of a true gentleman is, is Bud Helmrich and what he represented. One of the most interesting parts of seeing that film, and, and uh, he said to me, I think in 16 millimeter, and thanks to Dave Quam, he converted it to me to a, um, a VCR, and we've now got the honor and can thank Dave for putting this thing on the disc so we can all have a look at it. The thing that to me is so interesting in this film, this was, I think it's the dates in there, and it was done in the, um, I think the late 50s, it's kind of the innocence of the whole thing. Here's a guy sitting in Wichita, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the land, probably nobody ever knew where this airplane was going to go, and he went all the way to basically Barrow, Alaska, in that airplane in the next two weeks. That was his first wife, Connie, in that movie you see her, and she she lasted, I think, until um, the mid '60s. At that point, she had enough. Can you imagine living in Colville, where probably the average height, average hot day there in the winter was minus 20, and you could easily find minus uh, 40 or 50 every day. And then he remarried another woman called Martha, and they were both very charming and loved the North and appreciate what it was. But the innocence of this film and seeing them flying north and why it might look a little crude and a little outdated with all the modern capabilities we have now with video, this was done in 16mm, uh, handheld, one camera, you know, nothing fancy. And the film is really, while you kind of feel bad that some of it isn't as good as it could be. It's a spectacular film to me. And it was very rewarding, and I certainly want to thank Dave Quam for putting that so the rest of us can see that. The interesting part of that film to me was to show you how old it is. That's a Cessna 140, an Edo 88A1650, excuse me, 88-1650 floats with the old A-frame installation, which has been replaced with a standard installation. And to see that airplane... And then he probably flew a couple of those. I think he had a 120 and a 140. And then he went to a Cessna 170, and that was his main airplane. And in the later days, he had a, a Cessna 180, and that's what he had up at Colville and up at Walker Lake. And, you know, they certainly proved what a workhorse a Cessna airplane is. And I'm just depressed he, if he even listened to this movie. He said he was always able to get him started. And I don't know how he got him started in those kind of temperatures, but he somehow worked it out. And another thing, I'm just watching the movie now, and people ought to look. It used to be when you went to Alaska and you walked along the beach, there were those glass balls that were used for fishing nets. And they've now gone to plastic. And a glass ball, if you can find a big ball like that today, it's worth $100, $200. And so it was really interesting for me to see the glass balls because it used to be when I went up there, you'd kind of go along the beach and kick them, but you never thought they were of any value. And now they've completely disappeared from the world. When he came in, he made just one pass at us. He knows the ground that well. Just one glance and he can land. himself, to me the greatest pilot that ever was. It used to take weeks and months to cover here what it does in one hour in the state. It certainly changed travel in the Arctic region.
Mr. Zobo, the Eskimo. He's flown quite a few miles with me. He handles a plane sometimes, although all he has ever traveled with before is a dark sled. Of course, you can't make an accomplished pilot out of a Stone Age hunter in one hour, but he does and boots all the time, which is, of course, our attire about four-fifths of the time. Shut up, waterborne. on the alert all the time so as not to strike ice when you take off. Watch how this Cessna rolls out of the water. And with our work over, once again we head for home. And again, we change planes. As I mentioned before, there are four airplanes, and we change back and forth all winter long. This is our 170, our latest. And I might add, number 9292A. I don't think we will ever forget our numbers on our planes. Honey is flying the first part of the trip into the lake. Here we've set the camera on automatic operation back on the baggage track. Just beginning the turn, going in down toward the lake. Our lake lies in a horseshoe-like canyon in a valley and peaks rise above about 4,000 feet all around it. And the lake isn't very large. In order to make a landing, you swing in toward the canyon, turn in under the cliff, then you come back down to the lake for a landing. It's all quite simple when you're flying a Cessna. The water here is about 45 feet deep, and we have a float with a log chain around 60 feet long that's tied to a big rock, and we drop it down through the ice when the lake is frozen over. And the sun gets redder and redder as it swings farther toward the south. Here's a big fellow, a moose, swimming toward our cabin. To kill a great moose, only to cut off a few stakes and have the rest of the animals spoiled by sun and flies within a few hours, is not only a legal crime here, but it is ethically unnecessary. rather impossible to take off with a heavy load such as we have here. So we use the plane as a tugboat to haul the sheep that we've killed from one end of the lake to the other. Might be risky to fly a 140 with a load like that. First heavy snow of winter, and here is one of our better known citizens of the north. Real live Herman.
Now we break the ice around the pole, which has been in the water for some time. Attached to the lower end of it is the fish net. No pilot today is permitted to fly over unsettled areas of the Northwest Territories of Canada unless the airplane has been inspected for emergency equipment and the fish net is considered an indispensable item. Connie pulls the net while I stand at the hole with a spear and watch for fish coming up. There are enough weights on the net so that it sinks to the bottom of the lake, does not come up and freeze to the ice, and we use the same net all winter long. It's something different to take off from the ice with floats. Now, these floats are very tough, and in all our four years of Arctic flying, we have never had a hole in a float and I've landed on bare gravel runways on several occasions. This is the nearest trekking post, 100 miles from our camp. And we flew there to exchange our floats for skis. The exchange has an airplane too. Actually, the airplane has taken the place of the dog sleds in the north. The dog team is used now for sport or in the extreme far regions by the Eskimos for hunting. Certainly there is no higher praise that a man can give an airplane than to say it stood up under four years of Arctic flying. Now we're flying out toward the Arctic Ocean. The plane we're in is our new 170. The Brooks Range that divides Alaska and Canada is the highest range of mountains in North America. And it is some of the most beautifully rugged country in the entire world. Connie and I were within 400 miles of the North Pole. And here's our camp out on the Arctic ice. hunting on the ice all day. You can see the dog team out on the ice there now. Thank you. 
driving dogs on the rough ice. They're lashed together with rawhide, so when they spring, the reins won't break. When it comes to transportation, the dog team is as far behind as an ox cart would be on the highways today. Of course, this is not true for traffic and where people still make their living from hunting on the ice. The airplane is most prevalent today in the Arctic country. For exploration, however, you can't beat the combination of the modern aircraft and the old-fashioned dog sled. Now we're coming in for a landing again. You have to be careful not to hit a crack that's drifted over with snow or a piece of ice that's knife-shaped and standing on edge. Some days when the sky is overcast, it's almost impossible to see even high pieces of ice when flying. The whole world looks flat and white below you. Notice how the spring gear takes up the shot. Snow landings are rough and very hard. It always amazes me to see how that spring gear bumps around. It is scare a pilot to death to look out and see that gear when you're landing or taking off on rough ice, but I have never had the least bit of trouble with it. Just a little fellow. Polar bears live on the sea ice, but never come to land. We don't have them in Alaska. We have them north of Alaska or on the sea ice. This one, Connie Shaw. It was rather a small bear, wouldn't weigh much over 350 pounds. There's a little different view of Yalu Point. You saw it earlier in the fall. This spring gear is the best gear we have in the north by far. If we had been using a conventional gear, it would have been torn off the plane a dozen times. always blow directly, either from the east or the west. Well, he's 
seen a lot of these storms. He knows the wind will blow about a week in one direction, then turn around and blow from the other direction. Storms over, bright sunshine. And here's a couple of well-fed northern puppies. Gassing up operations. Now you have to be extremely careful not to spill the gasoline on you, because at 30 or 40 below, it will really cause severe burns. Our Cessna carries 42 gallons. We get around 14 miles to the gallon. However, when the temperature gets very low, you burn a lot of gasoline. At around 50, at about 8 miles per hour. We have a little over a quarter of a million miles of flying time to our credit without a single mishap. And the engine has never refused to start at any time in all that travel. And this is some of the worst travel you can find. now coming off the ice. And there's water below us in many places. This constant round of changing gear in the north. Skis to floats, then to wheels and back and forth. In one place you can fly on skis, you have to land on floats. In another place you can take off on wheels, but you have to have skis to land. To have a balance where you're going with where you've been. Here we have to have our wheels to fly south. So we put on our wheels, pick up our floats, and change again before we can get back home. We fly with the skis inside the airplane when we're on our way home.